Let's do the 1993 ENM FRQ number one, which is right here. And this first one, it's that's a pretty straightforward one actually, um, except that they uh, well they give you this uh, solid non-conducting cylinder of radius R shown above is very long. It contains a negative charge evenly evenly distributed throughout the cylinder. That may, that's a really important little phrase there. So pay attention to that. Just pay attention in general. Evenly distributed throughout the cylinder with volume charge density of rho. Point P1. Where is point P1? Right there. It's outside the cylinder at a distance R1 from the center C. And point P2, right there, is inside the cylinder at a distance of R2 from its center. So there's R2. Both points are in the same plane, which is perpendicular to the axis of the cylinder. All right. So on the following uh, cross-sectional uh, diagram, draw vectors to indicate the direction of the electric field at points P1 and P2. So let me redraw that. And uh, so here's our cross section. Obviously, when you take the test, you won't have to take the time to redraw it. But um, and so here's P1. Now the key here is that this is negatively charged. And so if you put a little positive test charge right there, it's going to be attracted to it. And then P2, this is P1, so here's the electric field there. And then here the electric field is going to be towards the center. Because now, that's E2, I'll call this E1. Now, this one's going to be a little, uh, well, I don't know. Um, they only really want you to indicate the direction. But it's toward the center on both of them. If you did that, I'm sure you got it. Um, I hope you got that. I mean, you have to pay attention to the charge. I mean, I think that's the only thing tricky about this is that it's a negative charge instead of a positive charge. You know. But remember, what is an electric field? It's something that applies forces to charged particles. You put a charged particle there, it's going to feel a force. And... Uh, so you just indicate the direction of the force, and that's the electric field. Okay, part B. It says, um, let's go back to the paper here. It says, use Gauss's law, or using Gauss's law, derive expressions for the magnitude of the electric field E in terms of R, capital R, rho, and the fundamental constants for the following two cases. When you're outside the cylinder and when you're inside the cylinder. Now, I really hope you got this one. This is a basic problem. This is like, a, you know, we did this in lecture, and, we, and, and it was one of the example problems that we did. So, um, and it's a cylinder. So let me uh, kind of redraw things here, which you probably won't need to do. But let me kind of redraw this cylinder. Um, so this has got all this negative charge in it, evenly distributed. So for part I, if you're outside, here's your Gaussian surface. And so you're going to just surround it with a, a cylinder. Remember that the surface area that you surround the charge with has to match the symmetry of the charge and therefore of the electric field created by that charge. And of course, Gauss's law is E dot dA equals the charge enclosed over epsilon naught. Well, uh, the only surface area, and remember the electric field is coming in like this from the outside, you know, so um, the, the area out here, the end caps of the cylinder are not involved. It's just the you know, this part right here, curved part of the cylinder. And of course, what is that area? Well, it's 2 pi r times the length. 
So E, and then the A is 2 pi R times L. And I'm going to call this L. Now you say, well, that's not one of the fundamental, or not one of the things that they ask for, but it, it, it always cancels out. It'll cancel out. Now, how much charge is enclosed in there? Well, all of it is. But how much charge is enclosed? So let's figure out the charge enclosed before we plug it in. Do I, should I blow this up? Is this too small? Okay. The charge enclosed, of course, you're sitting in the front. The charge enclosed <laughs> is, um, well, it's all inside this volume right here. So we need that volume times rho. So it's going to be rho, which is a volume density, the charge per, per unit, uh, per, per cubic meter. And then we need to know, well, it's, the, it's this area right here times this length. And that area is pi, and uh, this is big R squared, capital R, from there to there, and uh, times L. And that's my... That's my charge and close. So rho pi r squared times L over epsilon naught. And now um, we can, uh, let's see. Oh, that's right. And then so E is equal to, well, let's cancel some stuff out here. And then solve for E. Let's see, you have rho and r squared left. And <clears throat> you're, then you're going to divide by some stuff. Uh, I'm going to divide by 2. And I'm going to divide by little r. But I like this is the variable right here. I mean, all these things are constants. So this should be 1 over r. Oh, I left epsilon naught. I always do that. And then 1 over r. That should be your answer for the electric field. Of course, what's the direction of this electric field going to be? I don't know if they ask you for that. No, they just ask for the magnitude. But it's in the negative r hat direction, right? Towards the... Uh, well, actually, that's not really true. Uh, it's towards the central axis of this. All right. Part C. Well, first of all, any questions on part There's a part 2 of B where you're solving the side of the Oh, yeah, yeah, thank you. I forgot the little part 2. Jet lag is still having its effect. Um, so let's do the second part. Now, the second part, you're, you're inside here. So your Gaussian surface, this is getting kind of messy, isn't it? It's inside. So this is going to be E dot dA equal to the charge enclosed over epsilon naught. So then we'll work on this side, E times A. Well, the area now is, is still 2 pi R L. That didn't change. because But the R is a lot smaller now because we're inside. But now the charge enclosed, it's going to be different. It's going to be the density Okay, times the the uh, volume, but now the volume is the Gaussian surface itself because we're inside. We're not going to include all of the charge, only some of the charge. So that's going to be pi r squared, little r squared, the radius of my Gaussian surface squared times L. So this is the charge enclosed over epsilon naught. Now that's the big deal. That's the big idea that when you're inside one of these uniform, or if you're inside a non-conducting surface, the charge that's outside your Gaussian surface isn't contributing to the electric field, uh, only the charge that's inside the Gaussian surface. So let's cancel out that stuff and solve for E. And we're going to divide by 2. And oh, this R cancels this R squared. So it's going to be rho over 2 epsilon naught times r. And there's my electric field right there. So here, when you're outside, the electric field is getting weaker. 
because you're getting farther and farther away from the charge. But when you're on the inside, your electric field is getting stronger as you move away from the central axis because there's more and more charge that's contributing to that electric field. Okay, I hope that makes sense. All right, let's do the next one, which is uh, part C. Now, part C is the same drawing, but it's a completely different problem. Let's take a look. Because now we're dealing with current. We're not dealing with the static electric charge anymore. So it looks very similar, but um, see, before we're using Gauss's law for electrostatics, and then now we're going to use Ampere's law. It says another cylinder of the same dimensions, but made of a conducting material, carries a total current I. Uh, parallel to the length of the cylinder as shown in the diagram above. The current density is uniform. Oh, that's nice. When the current density is uniform, go outside. The current density is uniform throughout the cross-sectional area of the cylinder. Points P1 and P2 are in the same positions with respect to the cylinder as they were for the non-conducting cylinder. So, um, it says, so, so on the following cross-sectional diagram, uh, in which the current is out of the plane of the page or towards the reader. So the current is, you know, whoop, whoop, coming at us. Um, draw vectors to indicate the direction of the magnetic field at points P1 and P2. So uh, let me redraw it so I don't. So this is uh, C. And so here's my wire. Basically, it's a wire, right? Here's the center of the wire. Here's P2, and here's P1. And remember to use Ampere's law to figure out the direction of the magnetic field. Now, here we have a long straight wire, so you grab it with your right hand. So if I grab this with my right hand, here's my right hand, I'm going to grab it and my fingers curl counterclockwise. So the magnetic field is moving counterclockwise like this. So at this particular point, the magnetic field is like that. Now on the inside, it's the same thing. The magnetic field is moving in a circle like this. So you just draw a little arrow tangential to that. So those are your magnetic field directions at point P1 and P2. Now notice that I didn't draw a curved line. I just said, okay, right there, the magnetic field is in, is to the left. Okay? And so I'm going to show that with an arrow. So it's to it's it's to the left. You know, don't draw a curved line like that. Okay? Um, it, you know, for at a particular point, it only has one direction. So draw an arrow showing only one direction. Does that make sense? Okay. All right, let's move on to part uh, D. And part D says, use Ampere's law to derive an expression for the magnetic field B inside the cylinder in terms of R, capital R, I, and the, or, uh, the current and the fundamental constant. Okay, so we're on the inside. And let me go back in. Well, Ampere's law, B dot ds equals uh, mu naught i. And here the i is the current enclosed by my Amperean loop. So here's my Amperean loop. You see, look, in, look at this cross section of the cylinder. All the current is coming at you, all right? But only the current that's coming at you that's surrounded by this loop contributes to the magnetic field at this point. So the current that's here, that's outside, it contributes to the magnetic field out here, but not in here. So 
b and then the, the loop is just 2 pi r and that's equal to mu naught times the i enclosed by my empyrean loop well it's think of this in terms of area here's the total area pi r squared but then it's this area right uh, in here that you want because the ratio of the areas um, pi little r squared times i because look look what I have here i the current divided by pi capital R squared this right here is really the current density isn't it it's how much density is how much current is spread out over the area and this is how much area you're including within your Empyrean loop so that's why you multiply it like that and so the pi's cancel um, here oh you keep a pi there and then this r will cancel this and we have to divide by 2 pi so b is equal to uh, mu naught over uh, mu naught i um, and then we have on the bottom here we have 2 pi right so mu naught i over 2 pi and then we have this big r squared and then we have this r left over so this is all the constant stuff so really what this is saying is that the magnetic field is getting stronger and stronger and stronger in a linear fashion as I move from the center of this uh, out to the surface any questions on that and there was no part E so that finishes uh, FRQ number one